Adam's been a creative force in the New York jazz scene for how many years now? I moved here in 1989. Okay, so. About 40 years. And I started to become creative probably in <laughs> 1989. Yeah. 1989. So, I don't know, 30? 30, 35. No. Yeah, oh. around 35 years oh. in New York now. Adam has played in New York City with the Village Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, Fred Hirsch, the Maria Schneider Jazz Orchestra, uh, groups with Bruce Barth, uh, Judy Silvano, Lucia Polito, and John Abercrombie and Billy Hart. And uh, you can find Adam playing a lot at Bar Bayou in Brooklyn, usually on Thursday nights. And Saturdays. Thursdays and th Saturdays. Yeah. And occasionally also at Smalls with his own Smalls. group. Smalls, yeah, different, yeah. different, different, different venues. venues, right, yeah. yeah. Great, and Adam <clears throat> was a teacher at the, uh, professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst from 1999 to 2008. And he does teach privately. And he, all his music you can find on Spotify or Apple Music. With that being said, I first met Adam uh, when I visited New York about 10 years ago when I was 21 years old, and I heard him at a place called the Grassroots Tavern, and I was totally uh, taken back by his um, beautiful sound. And I think today we're going to talk a lot about sound. We're going to talk about a lot about sound. Yeah. <laughs> so, Adam, you studied with Joe Allard, right? Exactly, yes. Can you, can you talk a little about your experience? Because there's so much... Um, information out there about who Joe was as a person, what he said, and, right. you know, we can really get straight to the source of one of his students today. Right. Yeah. Well, and the interesting thing about that, too, is that uh, I think if you spoke to many of the students, a lot of whom are still around and playing these days, you might get different takes on what their experience with Joe was like for the reason that he probably addressed certain things with certain people depending on what he felt their needs were. And also that I think that, I mean, at least in my case, I'm sure that things have evolved over the years as I've, uh, you know, tried to work on and practice a lot of the concepts that I learned from Joe. Mm -hmm. um, so at this point, and it's hard for me to kind of um, separate what he said from what the way I think about it now, mm -hmm. and I think that's probably the case with a lot of people, but so that's, you know, what, primarily what I'm going to talk about today is, is right. what I remember and how deeply, and, and possibly how it's evolved through my uh, practice of his very basic concepts, and, you know, I think that's also part of the whole thing is that we become our own teacher. Right. All, you know, I'm, 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 I'm always, but certainly with, with a lot of his concepts, They've evolved over time, had my uh, opportunity to practice them. So Adam, I wanted to ask you, um, regarding this whole Joe Allard thing, what is the overall guiding like, principle concept and like, why, why, should we, um, why should people be interested in what Joe Allard has to say regarding saxophone playing? Right. Um, That's a great question and an important question because I think in my estimation, uh, the overall guiding principle is what really is possibly maybe the most important uh, lesson that I learned from my study with him, in addition, of course, to all the specific exercises and concepts. Mm -hmm. But to me, the overall concept that Joe, I think, talked about, either directly or indirectly, is that we have or we should or we have to have some kind of idea in our imagination. I think he referred to it as tonal imagination, mm -hmm. although never with, I, I never heard that term from him, but I, I've seen that from other people. Have something, some kind of imagination idea in our head of what we want the sound to be like coming out of our horn, and that has to do with pitch, volume, articulation, timbre, all, everything associated with that. And we want to eliminate any obstacles that might be in the way of allowing our body to express that sound that we're imagining. Right. I think that's basically the overall right. concept. That we want to eliminate any kind of tension, any kind of anything that is going to, yeah, as I said before, get in the way of us trying to express right. that sound that we're imagining. Right. Because when, you know, most saxophone players, when you start playing, you kind of, 
you know, you slap you slap on a mouthpiece right. and a reed, and and you don't really have an idea of any of right. what's happening here. You right. kind of just blow and get the sound right. out. But then as you develop as a player and you start hearing sounds that cater to your own taste of what you like, right? You start a being yourself and kind of like going for a certain thing. Like for you, I. I definitely hear a lot of Sonny Rollins hmm. uh, in your sound, that, well, where, where you're coming from, but you've somehow also like, um, you know, found other things that you like, like special tam timbral things. And, um, I, you know, I want to talk about um, the embouchure mm -hmm. and, and like, what does it mean to actually have like a loose, loose embouchure? And is that important mm. to have a loose mm. embouchure? You know, I don't, I don't necessarily think of it that way, and I don't know if, again, I, I don't know if Joe thought of it that way, other than, uh, you know, loose, I guess, loose as a result of uh, elimination of tension. Right. I think, you know, and, and the other thing I wanted to say, too, in, in, along with what you said, which is true, is the saxophone is a pretty easy instrument to get a sound out of. Right. And I think when we all started... Right. That's what happened. You, right. you, like you say, you put the reed on, blah, 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 you right. know, and right. you're good to go. And, yeah. um, uh, uh, but um, as far as the loose embouchure with what I studied with Joe was, there was no pressure applied to the reed mouthpiece setup by the lips or the muscles surrounding the mouthpiece. Right. The lip in his estimation, is a sensory organ. It's not something that applies any kind of pressure or anything to the reed. Mm -hmm. and, our, and Joe was great. He used to like have all these uh, stories that he used to tell uh, to uh, very colorful stories to like um, uh, make his point. And, yeah. and the story that he used to tell about the lower lip was of a, of a young soldier going off to war <laughs> and trying to uh, present a very stoic uh, appearance to his parents, right. you know, he's, I'm, I'm going, you know, and saying goodbye, shaking his father's hand and shaking everybody's and saying goodbye, and he gets to his mother, and as soon as they kiss goodbye and the lip becomes involved, that's when the tears start to flow, because that was really like, that's where, you know, Joe would say a lot of the emotion, I guess, was stored, you know, I don't know if it was stored in the body, but that's, it was, it was a sensory organ, and that's, and it can't really be I guess as, as sensitive if you are trying to apply tension or any kind of force with the lower lip itself onto the reed. Right. So the reed itself is a cushion. Right. And he would al always make the analogy that uh, of uh, of the reed and the thick uh, sorry the lip and the thickness of the reed to the felts on piano hammers in a piano and mm -hmm. you know the difference between the lower register where the felts are very thick and very absorbing as opposed to the upper register where the felt's very thin and not absorbing at all of overtones and stuff. And so that was basically how he looked at the lip and the function of the lip in producing the sound, right. that it would, it would act as a cushion. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about that later in terms of specifics of that. Right, right. And the other thing that I think that applied to was the corners of the, uh, of the mouth, which he uh, felt very strongly that there should be no tension in the corners. And that's often why you hear, when I play and some other people play, you hear air leaking out of the corners of their, of the sides of their mouth because they're not trying to clamp down mm. uh, to create a seal. Right. He would make the argument that if you are applying pressure with your corners, that the result would be bending of the sides of the reed right. up. Right. And I've he heard would always... This. Every uh, every week we always he always would say, in physics according to the physics a vibrating object vibrates most efficiently in a straight line. Right. And that's the reed unless you're applying pressure to the sides and it curves and then all of a sudden you're losing a bit of that efficiency of the reed vibrating. Right. right. And so that was, uh, I remembered the rationale that he shared with me about why we don't have uh, tension in the corners, and um, the only thing really involved in applying pressure to the reed as we know that there needs to be is these chewing muscles these jaw muscles that we're born with that we are born with that and are and again he would always 
talk about how strong they are when we're born with, and he would always talk about how women would be screaming in pain when their infants were suckling at their breast or something. Right. You know, so we're born with more than enough uh, uh, musculature mm -hmm. to create to to uh, exert the uh, right amount of pressure on the reed right. from below. Right. And the other thing, kind of along with that, is that uh, the pressure is apply it upwards to the reed and right. as opposed to Downwards. any downward pressure. And we can right. talk about that later too. Right. But so as far as, as far as I remember this, and I'm sure there was more that I'm not remembering now, but the specifics of tension in relationship to the mouthpiece of the reed, that was kind of, those were kind of the areas that he focused mm -hmm. on. That the lip is a sensory organ, the corners are to be loose, mm -hmm. and the only tension or any, the only thing involved in applying any kind of pressure or tension is our, our, our chewing. Is muscles. that what he meant about when he said X? Because I remember there was like this like little concept, he was, he would, he, in, in some of those Joe Allard master speaks videos, he would like chew up kind of like what you're doing right now. Yeah. 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 So yeah, the, yeah, the, we, yeah, our jaw is, our jaw is basically this, this is our skull, right. you know, the top part is, and yeah, it was just, it was just that right. the top teeth receive the mouthpiece, right. the jaw applies the pressure upward. Right. There's nothing, no right. downward pressure. So basically this is a concept in a way where if people were to be more sensitive, it, it would help them allow the reed to vibrate more, to try and get a more efficient and better yeah. sound. I would, I would think so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, th so those three things that we just talked about now, yes, they all feed into this overall concept of removing tension and allowing... You, get, uh, you know, uh, removing anything that gets in the way, uh, right. whether that be uh, keeping the reed from vibrating as freely, as efficiently as, uh, efficiently as possible. Right. You know, I don't know what happens when you start to try to bite you know, or, or squeeze the lower lip and stuff. Yeah, that would certainly inhibit right. things from happening. And, and the pitch, the pitch would change. The pitch, change. of course, yeah. would change. Yeah. And, uh, and when we talk about the lower lip more, I think you'll uh, maybe get a better understanding of, of what function it does provide and why another reason for it not to be involved in applying any kind of pressure to the reader right. or anything like that. And um, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, this is really interesting to me because I, I feel like as saxophone players, we're all on this constant search to get a better sound. And through that search, you know, we go through, you know, there's like the equipment search of, 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 but this is like the core fundamental of how you're getting the reed to vibrate is, is basically how you're amplifying your own, your voicing and your own sound through the instrument. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And how, how would you define um, a good saxophone sound? Like what, what well, is a good saxophone sound? I mean, for me, yeah. uh, colorful, yeah. vibrant, yeah. projecting perhaps, yeah. variable, yeah. That, you know, to, have, to not be uh, mono right. thematic or however you want to put it, right. to have many options in, at your disposal in terms of you know, how to color the sound. I don't know what other, what else is there. Flexibility? And Fle yeah, flexibility. Intonation, maybe? It, oh, intonation, yeah. certainly. Good intonation is certainly part yeah. of that. Yeah. And all of the, and all, again, all of these things that we talk about are served by some of the things that, uh, specific things we're going to talk about right. coming up. But right. again, it all starts with, you know, all of these things we talked about, having a variety of sounds, having good pitch, having flexibility, all articulation, all these things are self-directed. Right. They're not some, it's not a plug and play right. thing here. Right, you know? right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I, I remember when I first started playing, like, I heard Train and I, I got the Autolink mouthpiece, but then I would just play, I would play along to the records, but I couldn't get a sound for right. some reason. Well. And I felt like a lot of it was because I was working too hard and I was getting in my own way and I had my lower lip rolled in mm -hmm. and I was playing with way too much tension. And mm. as, as I started hearing about the Joe Allard concerts and stuff and doing like the, these various exercises that kind of help you free yourself from tension, mm. it would get the sound I was hearing easier. Wow, interesting. Yeah. 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 I think for me, the big fallacy from trying to emulate train, which a lot of us have done yeah. at, at, at least at one point in our life, was the throat. Yeah. It, it sounded like, 
it sounded to me as though his throat was open, like open, open, getting this big, like singing, you know, yeah. And you know, maybe that would be a good, you know, one good thing to talk about with Joe was about this whole throat thing. Mm -hmm. uh, was that um, the throat, in fact, is not necessarily involved in producing, in, in doing anything. Uh, uh, Awkward or untoward in, in, as far as producing the sound. Right. That and, and another story that he related. I remember, he, and this was pretty sure when he was, um, you know, Joe was very observant of fellow players, fellow woodwind players, flute players, oboe players. He'd always be picking their brains in terms of getting like little insights into how they're approaching it and how maybe that's applicable to the saxophone. Right. And he was playing with some serious players back then, Julius Baker. You know, great. He was playing in the New York you know, NBC Symphony with Toscanini. Yeah. The throat thing, he he um, related the story of, I, I can't even imagine this happening, but he said it happened, it was a, a famous soprano was speaking with Toscanini and asking him how she should conceive of her throat, what she mm. should be thinking, what should she be doing with her throat. And Toscanini's answer was, you should sing as if you have no throat. The point being is that, again, getting back to our no tension kind of right, thing. Right, no tension. That we're not doing anything in our throat, that our throat is pretty much a passageway for the air to go through. Right. And, it, we, and again, we don't want to interrupt... The airstream. The airstream, yeah. which is sacrosanct in right. everything we do. Right. And along with that throat thing is this concept of the, the voice box or the, mm -hmm. the Adam's apple, which in his estimation, and... Uh, yeah, I can just say now, a blanket statement, I pretty much agree now after the pr practice of 40 years of everything that he said, is that we don't want to inhibit that from being able to move right. because that is so involved in our basic premise, which is, is our body being able to respond to the signals that our ear is sending to our body right. below a conscious threshold that al allow these parts of our body that need to respond in a free way to right. express right. the sound that we're imagining. And so that was why we wanted to uh, eliminate any tension in the throat. And not only that, along those lines, something we talked about in terms of uh, the whole mouthpiece thing uh, is I, I found to be very important. And, and back to uh, you know when I first started playing the saxophone, nobody ever said anything to, anything to me about this. Downward pressure on the mouthpiece. Uh, that his explanation for why we don't want to apply any downward pressure on the mouthpiece is because that inhibits our Adam's apple from being able to move freely. Right. And you and he would demonstrate, and you can hear it when you talk. If I'm just talking and then I move my, th you know, you know, my, the sound changes. It sounds different. It sounds very different. It sounds cut off. It sounds yeah. yeah. I mean, w what it sounds like is really not important. It's just, it's just different, and it's not how I sound when I'm speaking freely without any kind of tension in my throat. Yeah. So that, and that is, that freedom of that is addressed by A, playing with your throat as if you have no throat, not introducing any tension into it, uh, and B, not applying any downward pressure on the mouthpiece. Again, right. keeping in mind that the only, uh, the only muscles that are involved, only pressure, tension involved in, in that mouthpiece, uh, mouth connection is upward using these very strong muscles in our jaw very naturally. Right. Very simple as that. Right. And this actually kind of brings up another point that I think needs to be addressed is that, you know, we're jazz players. We're not, and so there's no right or wrong for us. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are designed, as I see it, you know, to optimize things, but not necessarily aimed at, uh, exploring all of the possibilities of all the things that we can do with all of our body all of our body parts if we want to try them and see what happens you know right. so all of these things even though in Joe's estimation or the way I learned it there was a right or wrong about these things it's also more about just being aware of the mechanisms that are involved in doing the right or wrong and trying the wrong and right. seeing how that has an effect on right. your sound, which can be equally as valuable right. to increasing your palate as, a, as, as an expressive uh, player. Absolutely. You know, so, you know. Like so, developing though, sensitivity to what is actually happening when you're yeah, playing your horn. Exactly. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of stuff to go over today, yeah. and there are individual things that 
uh, you've talked to me about, you know, through, you know, us hanging out yeah. and me getting to know you as a great saxophonist. What are some exercises or how can one person explore uh, practice in a way right. where they could find out areas of eliminating tension? I, I think one thing that has to be said too is that listening to me or to anybody else that studied with Joe talk about this is really just the tip of the iceberg. You know, yeah. all these things really benefit from, because, you know, we're gonna be, if, if my experience is like yours, you're going to be experiencing and becoming aware of a lot of things that you've never been aware of before in your body. So it, it's just going to take time. And, you know, it helps to have somebody monitoring or whatever or just, like, checking in and seeing yeah. how things are going. But it's also important uh, to understand why we're doing these things and, as you say, some exercises that might facilitate some of these right. things. Um, it's not a one day fix. Like this it's is a definitely long term. Not a, it's study. definitely not a one day. You know, with with yeah. any with any thing that we're trying to re uh, teach our body to relearn something or to learn something, it's certainly served. It t takes a while to Correct. learn those things, and it's certainly served with you know not necessarily like I'm going to practice this for an hour today and nothing for the rest of the month. Right five minutes each day to try to start right. to try to train your body right awareness Awa you know yeah. but also to try yeah. to train your body to to do these things and these parts of your body that you haven't really paid much attention to before to do these things uh without having to think about them anymore right. you know this is why you say sometimes you notice that blah but you know i'm cool you know in the practice room i'm cool but then i get out you know and all of a sudden i realize that i'm not breathing well or something i'm too yeah. much tension or something yeah. yeah i mean that's a function of of time mm -hmm. And a function of just accustoming, uh, making your body accustomed to doing these things without thinking about, you know, the same way we walk. Right. We don't think about... The way we step. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We just do it now because we've yeah. done it for so long. Yeah. We don't have to think about it. And so hopefully these things become that way. Let's start with some, like, what is... About tension. Yeah, like, the, maybe the most, the start, we can start from the most fundamental thing, which is... Mm. Uh, uh, I always had a hard time with this. I felt like I was never breathing well. Mm-hmm. On my instrument. Okay, great question. Yeah. And that was also something that I was certainly not aware of at all when I studied with Joe. And the first thing he did was to make me or to show me how to even become aware of the amount of air that is at my disposal. I was certainly breathing from the chest up, right. which is using only a minimal amount of the air that's uh, available and one thing that uh, one exercise that he did that I find very helpful for me and for my students and we can try this too. This is yeah, and Intention. yeah, and I, I, what I was going to say to that before we even get into this is that for me, not only as a as a, as a woodwind player, but as an improviser, mm -hmm. and arguably as a human being, one could say that br I, breathing is like the most important element in this whole yeah game yeah. And as I, as I mentioned before, for me, I didn't even know, I wasn't aware of the capacity that I had to breathe or mm -hmm. even how to breathe or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and it's weird to talk about breathing because breathing is something that we all do all the yeah. time. We breathe very freely and naturally. Yeah. But one th exercise that he did, one of the few exercises that he had us do to introduce us to the capacity that we have at our disposal in terms of breathing was to just lean, bend our knees, lean over, put our, our weight on our thighs, mm -hmm. Everything droops, our head droop, droops, our, our arms, everything is, there's complete, everything is completely loose. And, and, and taking some nice deep breaths in that position, through our nose particularly, for some reason focuses the air all the way down into, the, into the, our lower back. Yeah. So we can really feel our entire lungs expanding and our body expanding as mm -hmm. a result of our lungs expanding. You know, before I'd be, you know, I'd take a breath and would be like, you know, and your the shoulders, shoulders are going And up, now, yeah. yeah, now the shoulders aren't involved at all. No. So, yeah. A, that wor speaks towards tension, right. elimination of tension in our right. playing when we're, you know, like this right. and breathing like this and our arms are tight and our, you know, so that, you know, ultimately is kind of taken care of. But then, you know, when we're able to realize that when we take a deep breath, we can imagine, and, and breathing is always kind of like a hard topic to discuss and to describe mm -hmm. because it's so... Uh, ephemeral, you know, and so it's, it's, it's a hard concept to, you know, th that's why I always think about, you know, I always mention to anybody who talks about this to check out um, anything you can find about uh, 
meditation or yogic breathing because mm -hmm. they all, you know, and, and you might find one person's description speaks to you and, and resonates with you. So, you know, yeah. it makes sense to you. Yeah. But again, in this position and in, in that position and taking a breath and realizing that our lungs are much bigger, our capacity is much greater right. than we thought it was. Right. And we can imagine our air as we take a nice breath our lungs expanding in the back, in the lower back and everything, and everything is just expanding as a result of our allowing, again, eliminating tension, allowing the air to fill our lungs. Right. I sometimes kind of think of it as a sponge. Right. And as the air, and that in the sponge's case, the water goes into it, it expands. Yeah. And that's kind of how I imagine that. And so that was like, you know, mind blowing. To me just to be so that was I, I mean I, I I still have to check in with that all the time that took me a long time to mm -hmm. really be able to breathe uh, particularly when I you know and, and uh, particularly when you know the practice room I'd get it and then I'd go to a big band rehearsal or something and of course it'd be out the window so it just it took a while for that to start to become natural to me you know which again is a weird thing when we're talking about breathing because as soon as you talk about breathing, you start to get tense, you know, yeah. okay, but it's, it's all about relaxing. Yeah. And, well, I and definitely notice like when I don't play well or if I'm, play, if I'm anxious or if I'm nervous, yeah. it's usually coming from my breathing uh, uh, is me too. the source of me the problem. Too. Ab yeah. abso me too, yeah. absolutely. And, and as, a, as an aside and how yeah. a little bit of a demonstration how what Joe to what I learned from Joe as far as saxophone playing applies to my playing as, my, as an improviser, as a jazz player. Incorporating the breath into my playing mm -hmm. is an unbelievably important, right. not only for the sound, but for my ability to reflect on the ideas that I've been playing, or reflect on the ideas and prepare myself for the ideas I'm right. about to play. We often forget about, as you said, you know, you and I and everybody maybe of taking a nice relaxed breath before we express ourselves right. in our next right. the idea or something like right. that. So that, you know. Um, yeah, so breathing, step number one, awareness of how much air we have right. at our disposal. Right. The next question would be, how do we try to incorporate this or practice this, right. incorporate it into our, into our being? And with most things, I mean, and this is my whatever, and not, not only mine, but many teachers, I think, feel this way, is that when we want to work on something and try to make it our own, we want to just like, do it as simply as possible to start right. and not confuse the issue. Right. So I would just say, in this case, you know, just long tones. Pick up your horn and spend some time playing like a nice mezzo forte long tone. Yeah. Uh, I would, and, and again, to even simplify it more, start in a comfortable range of the horn. Don't be doing it down in the low Bs and Bs and B flats yeah. and Cs or up in the Maybe middle, middle G or something. Middle G, yeah. middle C, B, you know, yeah. all those. And the notes, the notes that feel most comfortable to you because what we're trying to do here is just work on breathing and putting the air through the horn. Right. I mean, that would be my suggestion. And then, of course, that leads to the idea of overtone practice, right. which would be maybe the next step in terms of incorporating this breathing into our playing but again any time any time we're trying to learn something new and in this case it's relaxed breath and imagining where our air is in our body right. and along with that maybe where the sound is coming from in our body yeah you know not up in here not up in here yeah, no shoulders no, right yeah and yeah exactly so when we're playing long tones we can every subsequent long tone we can think okay that was okay but my shoulders were kind of tense. Now I'll do the next one and I'll try to relax my shoulders a little more. Right. Okay, that was better. Okay, now I noticed that my whatever, you know, so you do a few of these. Great way to start your practice. Yeah. You know, uh, is, you know to get that air. Get the air moving. Moving. The horn. And, and yeah. try to make it as relaxed and as effortless and as thoughtless right. as possible. Right. It's yeah. almost kind of zen, right, in a way? Uh, absolutely. And, and yeah. you know, it's funny. Yeah, I mean, when, when I first, uh, when you and I first started talking about this whole thing, I had a, an idea of the title for this, which would be the Tao of, of Allard, Joe yeah. Allard. Because a lot of this is very in that sense in terms of like, you know, letting go, uh, 
the path will reveal itself as we let right. ourselves go and, and eliminate right. obstacles along the way. Right. And it's very much like that. Yeah. yeah. So it, it is very Zen. And again, that's why I said that uh, it might be a great idea to uh, search on the web for different people's explanations of how they think about breathing and how they communicate the concept of breathing. You know, because it is a difficult concept, I find, to communicate with students and other people. And as is often the case, there might be one person who says it in a certain way that, ah, oh, now I get it. Right. You know, now that makes sense. Right. Yeah. But, but the bottom line is just to you know, stay relaxed, not have ne unnecessary tension when you're breathing in. Breathe deeper. Get Alla that. Or allow yeah. the air to go deeper. Yeah. And does that mean you're breathing from the diaphragm? Uh, Joe would talk about the diaphragm, and he would rail against teachers that would talk about diaphragm yeah, he's control. Like, I saw the video, he'd be like, yeah. what do you mean diaphragm? Well, because, and I'll ex explain to you as best I can the way he explained it to me, as best as I remember, is that the diaphragm is a muscle that operates below our ability to control it. Right. The diaphragm and all the muscles surrounding our lungs, or I guess they expand or contract depending on how much air we're allowing into our lungs and how much our lungs are expanding. Right. And then that's where the concept of controlling that air comes from. Right. But we're not controlling our diaphragm. No. Our diaphragm is a muscle apparently that, you know, as our lungs fill up and uh, the diaphragm, I don't know, contracts or something. Yeah. And then once we're no longer breathing, on its own, the diaphragm will go, go back to its initial position, right. and that pushes the air out of our... Right. So I think, you know, everybody's talking about the same thing. I, th I think it just, it's a question of semantics. I think it's right. just the di We can't control our diaphragm. So right. if we talk about diaphragm control, that's... No, there's a video yeah. on... I th I'm not sure if it's Joe Allard speaks, but I s remember seeing a video of Joe Allard, someone asking him about diaphragm. Yeah, he just got like, a little off the set. He's like, yeah, he gets, he gets I don't, mean, even, I don't yeah. know what a diaphragm is. Yeah. I just use that when I go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. something like that. that. Sounds like something would say, <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah. And deep, well, and, and yeah. not to whatever, but those are potentially similar <laughs> activities. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know I, 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 you know, I often, when I speak to students about the concept of breathing, I, that's one kind of way I try to communicate what the feeling is like of yeah. putting air through the horn. Right. It's not, it's not blowing as, as Joe has said to everybody, uh, jouer, uh, Jouer ne pas souffler. To play is not to blow. Right. Ne souffler pas. Ne sou yeah. So in French, it's not. Pfft, you're not blowing up a balloon. Right. Yeah. Right. So great. Yeah. Great. But those but those muscular activities are not so dissimilar. Yeah. <laughs> from, you know. Yeah. So yeah. What's the importance of the fourth measure? Ah, Great. the fourth. I wrote that. Yes. Yeah. Some notes. Yeah. The fourth. Uh, when I first started learning studying overtones with Joe. And we'll get to that, I guess, in a minute, because yeah. that's a big kind of yeah. topic, and that kind of addresses everything, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, he wrote out an exercise that was a four-measure exercise with repeat signs on either end that we'd repeat. And the overtone exercise, this was the overtone matching exercise, where you'd play, for example, a C with the fingering C, then you'd finger a low C on the horn and try to re yeah. retain that C on the fundamental fingering and then let go the original C. And then there was, and those were the first three measures, the first three whole notes of that exercise. And then there's that fourth measure, which is a whole rest, a whole note rest. And to me, that is perhaps the most important part of that exercise, getting back to what I was saying before, how important breathing is to me in terms of playing, that gives you the opportunity to release whatever air is left in your body and to allow another relaxed breath in as you prepare to play those first three measures with the overtones again. Right. But to ignore that fourth measure is, is you're doing yourself a disservice because right. you're not incorporating, you're not allowing yourself to incorporate that breath into that exercise. Right, right. It's part of the, the actual thing. It's part of the thing. Yeah. But, you know, every time I show overtone exercises or long tone exercises to students, 
they always want to. They want to go to the next next round. Bah, 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 got it. Bah, 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 got it. Bah, 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 you know. But again, what we're trying to do here is to, you know, in a way kind of imitate or, you know, manifest what we're going to be doing playing our clarinet concerto or our our solo in our practice. Yeah. So it's playing these three slow exercises and making sure that we incorporate our breath into what right. we're doing. Right. Whether it's playing a solo on, you know, whatever footprints or whether it's doing an overtone exercise. Right. Or playing long tones. Right. Or playing scales. Right. Or whatever it is. We have to always remember, I think, to make sure we're relaxed yeah. and we're breathing. Yeah. And that serves everything. Yeah. So it's important to just slow down and observe it's and always get important. that last breath, that full breath in. And and I also want to mention too that I don't think it's always necessary to take a full breath. Yeah. But we do want to experience that to know what the capacity is there and understand what it feels like to relax. Yeah. To a, to make our breathing a relaxed experience. Yeah. And not a forceful experience. Absolutely. But it doesn't have to be the maximum breath all the time. Absolutely. It's just that's. I think Absolutely. a little impractical. Absolutely. You know. So Adam, I wanted to talk a little bit about tongue position and overtones now, because I think mm. those two things are intertwined and connected mm. with each other. Yeah, definitely. I mean, every, everything's connected and intertwined with each other, but those certainly in particular. Um, tongue position first. Mm-hmm. Again, back, back to what you, know, you said at the beginning, something I'd never, never thought about before. And... Uh, and that, I have to say, is often the case with most people that I try to talk about this with. And it's a very awkward uh, concept to become comfortable with. Is like to be aware, of, to be even, even being aware. Most people I ask, where's your tongue when you're playing? Most people are like, I, I haven't even... I don't know. No, yeah. I don't know. I never thought about it. Yeah. You know? So I, like the breathing, that's almost step number one. Right. And um, as far as the tongue position in general... Uh, you know, we have many options as a human being as to where our tongue can be in our mouth at all times. And uh, they're often, I mean, e- most easily, I think, approximated by thinking about different vowel sounds. I, E, O, U, e, you know, mm-hmm. all those different things. And Joe was particularly fond of and married to the concept of a high tongue position or a tongue position that is manifested by us saying the syllable e e e, e. and then uh, along with the e t t t t t t t t when we start to talk about articulation which we will in a second but e and he would explain it in this way that the sides of the tongue are anchored to the bottom of the top t right that's how he would explain it which seems a little overly complicated to me but it's certain but if you spend some time thinking about it and if you, if you kind of just say mm, E, it mm. kind of does that. It kind of does that, yeah. yeah exactly. It gets you that shape. Exactly, exactly. Because when we're talking about tongue position, we're not talking about the tip of the tongue. Or we're talking not about the, yet. The we're back. just talking about the, the, the shape. The, 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 over the back of the tongue, yeah, yes. Yeah, the back of the tongue, yeah. And uh, the reason for wanting to be aware of, of our tongue position is because uh, it has such an effect on the airstream being produced by, you know, through our lungs, not our diaphragm, through our lungs, mm-hmm. going through our mouth into the mouthpiece. And depending on, uh, and that, that tongue position is going to affect primarily the speed of the air. Uh, and this is where maybe I can demonstrate yeah, it a little absolutely. bit. Yeah, um, absolutely. And the speed of the air is also going to affect the pitch of the air, the pitch of the, the sound, and also the quality of the sound itself. Right. Um, so uh, here's here's uh, there's a like a middle C uh, mm-hmm. concert B flat with a high tongue position E, and now if we start doing ah, you can already hear Different. a duller. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say it's not valid, and it's certainly something we might want to use to our benefit in terms of having a wider palette, especially as a jazz musician. Mm-hmm. Ah, oh. You can hear the pitch is changing, it's dropping already. Yeah. Ooh. Low tongue uh-huh. position. So, uh, so the pitch is dropping, the, the sound quality is changing. And what's going on is, is that I think we are making that airstream 
depending on where the tongue is in our mouth, more or less efficient. And so that the sound itself certainly is affected by that. And to my ears, the high tongue position gives us the most uh, brilliant, uh, shimmery uh, sound as a result of the, of the air speed that we're creating by uh, the, the high tongue position. Joe used to make the, uh, the analogy, and it's a great analogy, of, uh, of, of a hose that you turn the water on, you give an amount of water, and if you want to change the, amount, the, the speed that that water is coming out, we've all done right. this when we were kids at a water fountain, right. we, we, we make the opening smaller. Right, and then it goes... We, and, and water shoots out quicker, right. Yeah. And so we're doing the same thing with our tongue that we would do, do, whether we would do with our thumb over the, the opening of a hose. Uh, the right. opening of a hose. Right. So we're doing exactly the same thing. There's that initially, like the effect that has on the sound. The other thing, tangentially, it certainly makes our... It makes much more efficient use of our air capacity, so we can right. theoretically play longer because we're using less air to produce the same amount of volume or sound, you know, same amount of water. Right. Come, same amount of, we're not turning the faucet on any harder, but we're making that same amount of water come out faster because it's coming out yeah. less quickly, whatever. Right. Um, and, you know, that's basically it. As, as important a concept this is, to me, and I think to his overall teaching, it's all also very simple in, 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 in terms of explaining it. It's also very, very difficult to incorporate this and to make this something that is, is second nature and that we don't have to think about so right. much. I would also say, uh, and this is my experience, uh, someone who's not only a, a jazz uh, saxophone player, but has also dabbled in Broadway and classical music on, on other instruments, clarinet in particular, that this high tongue position I have found is absolutely key to creating a full, uh, colorful, vibrant sound on the clarinet. Right. And, and, and when you don't do it on the clarinet, it's much more noticeable to me on, than it is on the saxophone. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I know from experience that I'm much less you know, crazy about making sure my tongue is in the right position. When I'm playing on Broadway, mm -hmm. when I'm doing a show where I have to maybe articulate, uh, you know. That's C's, hard, yeah. That's hard. It's hard. It's impossible with a low tongue. Yeah. You it'd know, be too honky, It'd right? be honky yeah. and it would be imprecise. Right. So if that's a goal, and again, a lot of this is, I think, geared towards, you know, optimal precision, you know, if that's a goal to be able to do that, then you know certainly that tongue position is critical right. to being able to attack and to play low notes quietly, quietly, and with any kind of uh, control, control or, yeah. or sensitivity. Right. Um, which leads us to the other thing, you know, and and this again get back to what you started talking about, like when we start picking up the saxophone. I had no idea, and every low B flat that I played on the saxophone was, was loud. You know, yeah. it would come out when it came out. Yeah. I had no control over that. Yeah, and it would be loud, and, and you know, yeah. and so and the tongue takes care of that. You know, being able to play with a high tongue position and efficient air goes a long way to uh, solving that and addressing that issue. And even in the altissimo register. And even in the and of, yeah. and, th and now of course the tongue is applicable to now we go on another journey with the tongue, which is, yes, and then certainly, you know, in general, and take a step back, we might, I think, want to try to create some kind of homogeneity in terms of how we approach all the different registers of the saxophone, at least in terms of tongue position. Right. So we don't want our tongue to change as it goes down low, or our tongue to necessarily change as it goes up high. Well, that's not so much of an issue, but it certainly was an issue for me when I started playing, as when I went down low on the saxophone, my human feeling would be to go, la, la, you know, and yeah. I'd go down low and my throat, would, my jaw would drop, my throat would yeah. open and my tongue would drop. And that's exactly the wrong thing we want to do in, the, in order to retain the airspeed and, and, and everything that is a result, all the good things that are a result of that 
efficient airspeed right. when we go into it's almost like the, the lower register. The, of the saxophone horn. does doesn't want wants you to do that. It wants you to do all it these yeah excessive things. Yeah, I, it, it just feels natural, right? right? And that and that's like a weird thing because the tongue position at first didn't seem natural. But I will have to say that after a while, and I think that if we think about it, when our tongue is really at rest in our mouth, it's high. Our tongue doesn't rest like down here. Yeah, we have to not. make an effort. And so yeah. getting back to this initial part of the initial overriding concept, premise, theory about all this is that everything that we're doing here is going to feel ultimately relaxed and comfortable right. and not needing any kind of weird kind of manipulation to make it right. happen. Right. And this is one of them. But again, it's going to feel really weird at first. Right. The other thing that this does, which was also another major problem for me as a young saxophone player, was my articulation. By having your tongue in that high tongue position, e -t -t, the tip of your tongue, with which we articulate with, is right sitting right by the tip of the reed. Right. So the amount of movement, the amount of effort that it takes to actually articulate very cleanly and as with practice, subtly and everything, is so much easier. Right. When I first came to Joe, I was tonguing like in the middle of my tongue maybe, underneath. So Every it's time too, it would be too like, much of the reed. You know, it would just be sloppy and like yeah. flop, flop, flopping around. And now, it's so easy, you know? You know, you're right there. Yeah. It almost doesn't you know, even tongue, sound like you're tonguing, it, but you're very, you're just brushing the you're reed. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and by having your tongue there for starters, all of the different var varieties or variation you can get in your articulation is so much easier because it's right there. Right. The, the movement, it's like, you know, you hear people talk about like baseball. I'm a big baseball fan. And I think it's very analogous between sports and, and saxophone playing. But, you know, they talk about pitchers, particularly tall pitchers that have like unruly or unusual windups with a lot of motion in them. Right. And that, those are the usual pitchers. Those are the pitchers that usually have trouble finding the strike, losing the strike zone sometimes because there's right. just too many moving parts. Right. One little thing, you know. Too much is happening. Too much is happening. Yeah. You know, and they're coming from weird play. You know, pitchers that have a very controlled, you know, concise movement in their in their everything. Usually, they're much more, you know, able right. to throw strikes on a more consistent basis. Right. The same thing with us at articulation. You know, right. our tongue is right there, and so all of the very all the subtleties that we can explore with articulation is so much easier and so much more consistent, just because that's where we're starting from, right. rather than starting from hair, hop, 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 you know, all Absolutely. that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So that is the tongue. And, and as simple and, and as seemingly giving it short shrift here in terms of time, it's really, really important to everything moving forward in terms of that, that, the, the speed of the air, the velocity of the air, and our ability to articulate in a very clean and, 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 and controlled uh, and sensitive kind of way. Right. So that's, that's why people practice overtones, right? It's so and you can... that's another... Right. The overtones, and we'll talk about them in a second, we'll talk about them now, but you, know, you were talking before about things to practice in terms of... Yeah. The overtones to me are many things, but one of them is a good way for me to check in to see if I'm doing all of these things properly. Because if I am, the overtones and my overtone exercises will express themselves in a really nice, colorful, easy way. If I'm not, Something they won't. Wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we talked about before when we're, we were talking about our air and maybe applying it to just like long tones. And you know, I do the same thing with the overtones. Each subsequent time I do it, I think about, okay, the, uh, I, I judge it. I, I analyze what was going on. Was it good? Was it bad? Was it, and why was it good or why was it bad? And if it was bad or if I'm noticing that my, my head, is, head is applying downward pressure, my tongue is not in the right position, my arms are, are tense, I'm not breathing well, that's usually reflected mm -hmm. in a less than wonderful experience with my overtone practice. Right. And the overtone practice was a big, a fundamental uh, element of my studies with Joe. And 
what I learn from practicing overtones is never ending. I'm always learning something new about the horn, about sound, about what I'm doing through my overtone practice, through my breathing, through improvisation, everything. Without getting into too much detail, I'm assuming everybody kind of understands what the concept of overtones are. Uh, you know, it's a splitting of the, of the, uh, I, and now I realize that I have no idea what overtones are, but it's a splitting of the of the wave in half subsequently, yeah. and and each, and uh, you know if you take a string and cut it in half, you're going to get if you have a string that if you pluck it in, it's an A. If you cut it in half, you're going to get an A an octave higher. If you cut it in half again, you're going to get the fifth. If you cut it in half again, you're going to get the A two octaves higher. Cut it in half again, third. so there's an, a series of overtones, and those overtones are hopefully in some way or another present in all these sounds. Mm -hmm. We just don't necessarily hear all of them. We hear them as a potentially, hopefully, colorful sound that's right. filled with overtones and it's expressive right. and, and colorful. Um, but in my lessons with Joe, we would spend a lot of time practicing overtones. And uh, I alluded to this before in terms of that fourth measure thing where we breathe right. before we get into it. Right. The first exercise that we did with the overtones was what he would call a matching exercise. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure everybody knows this, but it was as simple as like dealing with like the first three or four fund the fundamentals on the horn, low B flat, B, C, and C sharp. Practicing it like, I'll do it with the C just for, I don't know why, okay. but we would do a matching exercise. And, oh, and this is something else I forgot to mention about the breathing as I'm sitting up, get about ready to play, when we are playing, oftentimes we're sitting or sta sta sitting or standing. When we're both, both when we're standing and sitting, I think it, it helps us to get the weight off of our lower back. Right. Then that will allow those muscles to be freed up to be able to expand when we yeah. breathe. So when I'm sitting and I'm playing, if I'm aware and not falling asleep, I'm trying to get my weight on my thighs. Right. So it frees up those muscles. And the same way, I won't stand up because I know it'll screw with the video. When I stand up, I try to bend my knees and, and try to put my weight on my thighs. I notice that when you play. When I yeah, see because you play. that really relaxes yeah. these skirt muscles and that then we want they, to be able to then expand. Then you can use those. Or then, we can, yeah, or then they can expand. Right. And, you know, I kind of learned this too when I used, I used to have bad sciatica problems. And the first thing they tell you to do is when you're sitting or whenever you're doing anything is try to get the weight onto on your, your thighs right here. and not on your lower right. back. Right. right. And for that kind of similar, same right. reason. Right. You want to have those muscles free to be able to expand when right. you're breathing. Um, so anyway, but back to that uh, initial, you know. So that would be the first exercise. And what we would try to do, and the way he would, so what I was doing, I was playing the C, and then retaining that same C as I move to the fundamental fingering, which is the C, the mm -hmm. low C, an octave lower, and then going back to the original C. Right. As simple as this exercise seems, well, I mean, it's not simple when you're first trying to do it, but there's so much involved in this exercise of overtones. Um, and Joe would present the study of overtones as an ear training exercise. It's not an exercise to figure out the minute, the, the minute uh, movements that we'd have to put our chin mm -hmm. or our tongues or whatever through to create the overtone. It's an ear training exercise, the concept being that if we focus on mm -hmm. that C, back to what we were talking about before, we focus only on that C and just that is what is directing our body, our Adam's apple, our right. chops, all of these things to produce that C when I go to the fundamental fingering. It's nothing else. It's no machinations that I'm going through with my body, no right. nothing. We're trying, and, and that's why, and this was like the first introduction to this concept of like everything's an ear training. Everything's about the ear. Mm -hmm. Everything is about developing, trying to develop this closer connection to this tonal imagination or whatever we want to call it and what's coming out of our horn in the most direct, uninterrupted fashion as possible. So in this case, we're trying to do just that, just trying to hear that C, and that is what is going to determine whether that overtone is produced well or not. Yeah. And the first thing we want to do, I th the first thing he had me do, is 
uh, you know, getting back to that natural tendency we have when we go down on the instrument to drop our jaw and to drop our tongue, that would, this, that's the first thing I had to work on. Right. And that's very noticeable if you're doing that, if you hear... If you hear any dipping in the pitch, yeah. you know that your tongue is not is moving. It's not in the right spot. Well, or this moving. Yeah. And we're trying to trick ourselves into not moving our tongue and to right. try to retain that same tongue position for these two. There's not there's no break, no right. interruption, no change in no dip in pitch, nothing. It's just right. try to make it as smooth as possible. And so that is our practice in trying to get and this is a big picture thing, our ear involved in what's coming out of our horn. Right. right. Which is, is a really important idea. Yeah. And Adam, I think a lot of people would want to know, like, when you're practicing overtone matching, how, 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 how many notes do you do? Like, I don't do it so much anymore. Yeah. You know, but... Uh, Can you just go through, like, would no. you go through... <laughs> So those that's the whole overtone right. series on there. Right. Uh yeah. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. pitch gets kind of funny, but but the principle is the same, you know, right. and I I I apologize because I really haven't been practicing that much, but these, well, I've been practicing, but not these things so much. Right? Maybe I'll get back to it. But, you know, again, it's about hearing the note first before and having what you're hearing, imagining, hearing, directing everything that's happening. Right. And to reverse that, that I think, uh, well, not to reverse it, but to take it one step further in one certain direction when we talk about altissimo notes on the saxophone mm -hmm. and people talk about oh, I want to play I want to play altissimo what do I have to do do I have to bite harder blah, blah, blah. there are certain things we can do to facilitate that yeah but ultimately we and I learned this from Joe we have to be hearing that note first before mm -hmm. we even attempt to play it mm -hmm. that's the first thing that will direct that will have more effect than you can imagine on whether those notes are going right. to come out or not and again it's allowing it to happen it's not forcing it to happen right. which is again part of that whole overall yeah. concept of, of what he was teaching i think yeah. maybe not in so many words but certainly that's what it was about yeah um and so and certain things i would think about when i'm doing the overtone exercise and these are all in in uh, about training the ear to or training ourselves or tra you know, uh, increasing our awareness training is we talk about maybe, I don't know if this is possible or not, but because that low, that the C that we produce on the fundamental is oftentimes more colorful, more potentially more vibrant than. I mean, there's a lot more in that sound. Yeah, there's there's a more, lot, I hear the harmonics. Yeah, the yeah. whole horn is vibrating. Yeah. Again, I don't know if this is possible to be done, but what we try to do is try to transfer that sound that we're experiencing when we're playing, when we're fingering the fundamental and playing the overtone, that first partial, back into the C when we get away the from the normal, first, the yeah, normal finger. Right, right. Try, you know, trying to teach our body, and again, is, is it able to be done? Maybe not, but what can be done is, try, is the trying. Right. You know, and here's another example of us, you know, just being involved with that, you know, trying to do whatever our imagination d does to fuel our imagination to try to, whatever needs to be done, to, we're, we're trying to express that sound. Right. So it's like we try to do when we do transcriptions. We try to copy train sound. We try to copy cannonball sound. We try, right. you know, whatever that is. And that's very often a reflection of us hearing it 
making making it our own in our imagination and allowing it to come through on the horn. Great, yeah. It's not about if you want to sound like this guy, you've got to do, do this. this and this. Exactly. Yeah. It's exactly. Like, yeah. It just strengthens your your concept of exactly. how you're hearing exactly hearing it. Exactly. And when you can hear it, exactly. it's going to come out easier. Well, exactly. It's yeah. going to come out easier and it's going to be you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's going to be yeah. more organic and it's going to be, you know. Yeah. And then we could talk about yeah. 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 Because you could you could you could go blue to the face and just be like, oh, you need to l roll your lip like thirty percent out right, more. Right, right, but at right. the end of the day, it's like, does it sound like the sound like that you want, or is, is, or is it... yeah? Oh, and it's just like kind of a wrong way of going about it. It's right. Like, you know, again, what's guiding that is you trying to do something rather than you just hearing it, imagining it, and just imit allowing it. You know, and of course there are specific things we can do right. to facilitate these things, right? right? Uh, and this is, I know I'm probably skipping over a lot of stuff, and this is where like the lower lip comes into play mm -hmm. and, and upward pressure on the mouthpiece. Joe would used to, used to think of the reed as containing like all of the, I'm explaining this very badly, but containing all of the overtones. And it's, and it's we are able to mask or release, release certain lower or upper overtones from being present in the sound. And the way we do that is with our lower lip. When we want to play low, on, when we play low on the horn, we usually have less mouthpiece in and more lower lip covering the reed. And conversely, when we're playing higher on the instrument and playing an altissimo, we want to have a little more pressure, a thinner lip, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, yeah, and as I said, a little more mouthpiece in our mouth, applying that pressure a little further in. And these are very subtle you know, difference, you know, it would probably even be hard to, uh, A, you know, write them down into, and B, everybody's lower lips are completely different. So right. what, what, what works yeah. for you, it might not work but for But we're me. not, we're, what we're not trying to do is to not let the lower lip mute or pinch the well, not, not, right. mute, not pinching, but, yeah. but certainly in a way muting in the sense that we want to mute some of the higher partials in particular, and this is very particular, uh, uh, to my playing, I mean, as well to a lot of other people, is that I kind of gravitate towards a darker sound. Right. So for me, that means that in general, I'm probably going to have more of my lower lip covering more of the reed surface because that's potentially going to mask some of the higher overtones. Right. And and I and for me, I like a little more shimmer and brightness. A little more edge or something. Uh, sometimes, so, maybe, so yeah. maybe I would go the the other way. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I, I I would do the same thing too. I mean, sometimes you know. You know, yeah, you want to play like that. You can create like the brightness. But you can also, you can play a subtone too. Right. My tongue was in the exact same position. My air supply was exactly the same. Right. The only thing that was different was I had a little less mouthpiece when I was playing the subtone and I had a lot more right. reed, uh, lip right. surface covering the reed surface. Right. And there was this very specific exercise to try to... Uh, develop the ability to specifically cover more reed with our lip when we want to go down. And this was another overtone exercise. And this was like a, a dropping from, from uh, the first partial and any other partials down to the fundamental. And the way we do this is, again, not by dropping our tongue or mm -hmm. our jaw, which seems like the natural thing to do if we want to go from, if we want to do that. Yeah. But retaining that set, you know, airspeed, don't touch it, tongue, don't touch it. What we are going to try to do is allow the mouthpiece to slide, slide is not the right word, to, to move out of our lower while retaining the connection of the lower lip to the reed. And it's not, it's not, sliding in and out but it's mm -hmm. the lower lip is rolling out mm -hmm. with the tongue mm -hmm. so we would do an exercise like <laughs> trying to get it to drop without again too much movement yeah that was yeah, a lot of movement with no movement yeah. the only movement that we're doing and we're exploring and it doesn't really happen at first it takes a while to, to get to develop this level of sensitivity mm -hmm. with our lip and 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 where the mouthpiece is in our mouth is by, and, and you know, give me your hand for a second. Joe, what, we, when we do this exercise, I'd be playing, uh, and Joe would come. 
he'd just be slightly, slowly pulling mm -hmm. the, the saxophone away from me. Mm -hmm. And if I were able to, you know, you know, this is extreme, obviously, mm -hmm. but allow my lip to roll out while it's adhering to mm -hmm. the reed, mm -hmm. it would mask the upper overtones and allow the lower yeah. fundamental to speak. Yeah. And sometimes it won't go, but that's fine, because that's it's not about the end result, mm -hmm. it's the process. You know, and, and again, there's no break in this, there's no dropping in the pitch or no yeah. break in the sound. It Connect. just very naturally drops because, again, the, my throat is not changing, my tongue height is not changing, my airspeed is not changing. The only thing that's changing is how much lower lip I have, so the, over the reed, how, and how much of the overtones that are present in that reed are being masked or allowed to express themselves. And it's, you know, intended, I think, to increase our awareness and sensitivity of our lower lip on the reed. Right. You know, there, again, there's no right or wrong about this. It's about developing that ability to, you know, right. be aware of that sensation. No, like the first time uh, I started working on those exercises, because I've been doing those for a while now, too, I definitely noticed before how much excess movement in my jaw and all mm. these things I was doing just to get the jumps, you know, yeah. like the wide jumps right. to get to the lower, right. lower register. Right. And I realized I didn't have to move so much. Well, you don't if you're, yeah. if you're yeah, yeah, you don't. Yeah. And you have to, a little bit maybe, a little but bit, again, but... right, and, and this, is, uh, this is like inserting a little bit of whatever, my, my whatever into this is that, you know, something I learned from playing flute, because we all know how horrible, like low, uh, how difficult it is to get the lower register on the flute with any kind of substance. Mm -hmm. And one of the exercises that you do as a flute player, one of the first exercises is you find a, a great note on the horn. I'll, I'll do B. Just... Mm -hmm. And then in a couple ways try to, because what we're going for is trying to retain, achieve some kind of homogeneity again in terms of in the entire range of the horn. Mm -hmm. Minimizing, as you say, the movements that we have to go through to get different registers of the horn. So, and I'm going to play this faster than I normally would. Okay. You know, right. so you, well, we all know that going down, l playing intervals, particularly wide intervals, going down on the saxophone is a problem. Right. Hard. And usually, bless you, usually, you know, you know, right. you, know, it, you want to honk it you out. You honk it out, yeah. or you're, you're going to drop this. So, you know, whatever. But if everything, you know, if you gradually try to increase that interval as we're widening it downwards and try to retain, it's almost like we're having to fool ourselves into trying to retain that tongue position, that jaw position, and. It might be leaking down there. Check it out for you. You know, those kind of yeah. wide intervals without any kind of break or and even and is, you know, something that we eventually get to, but it's it's through gradual practice of expanding those intervals and retaining that same tongue position and airspeed. And if we want to color those notes differently, that's where the lower lip right. comes in. Yeah, you can you change know. your EQ. Of the sound you can with the, very. With that's the lower a great lip. way of putting it. You yeah. can change your EQ with your yeah. lower lip, and it's very. I mean, I find it very noticeable on soprano. Soprano, you know, can as we all know, can be annoying, and in the lower lower register. I mean, it's great. It's fine. It's strong, yeah. but if we want to. You know, get a mellower, darker sound on soprano. It's not with less air. It's not anything other than it's your bottom lip. My bottom lip yeah. covering the reed. And yeah. My bottom lip covering the reed because I because I practiced. You know, mm -hmm. pulling, mm -hmm. adjusting where that mouthpiece is in yeah. my mouth, where I'm applying the pressure, and yeah. you know. You know, it's a big difference, yeah. and and it just and at that point it's just a question of yeah. personal taste and what you want it to sound like, but. That's the mechanism right. to 
EQ that sound. I noticed that not when the tongue, not absolutely. The, yeah. And I, I notice like when if I'm playing with a louder band, like a big band or R and B or like a, I'm doing like a funk thing, I got to project more, and right. I can change right here a little bit just to get more highs in my exactly. Sound. Yeah, Cut. yeah, yeah. You you play with a your lip rolled in more, so that it's right. thinner, as is the felt on the piano when you're up in the higher register because that's what they want to express on the piano. Right. And conversely, when you're in the lower edge of the, of the piano, when you look, the felts are really thick because it wants to absorb exactly. a lot of those overtones. Exactly. But of course, right, yeah. And so to your point, yeah, you learn, to, you learn to be able to EQ it. So when you get in that situation, you know that it's not necessarily about biting and squeezing. Uh, yeah. It's just about maybe taking a little more mouthpiece, a little less lower, yeah. re, l lower lip, yeah. allowing those higher overtones to express themselves. Right. And yeah, and that will... Uh, have a big effect, but again, we're not touching the air speed, air stream, right? We're not touching our tongue, we're not touching our jaw, right? You know, all of that. Hopefully, through our other slow practice, is starting to become something not only second nature, but also something that we've developed uh, a greater sensitivity right. to. If people come to New York and they want to come see you play, where can they, where can they find every, you? Every Thursday night, uh, I play at a place in, in uh, it's called Prospect Lefferts Gardens. It's called Bar Bayou on Nostrand Avenue. And it's been uh, fantastic. Every week uh, we have a different group. This week it's uh, our special Steve Cardenas, Kayvon Gordon, myself, and Jeremy Stratton. Uh, last week was with Bruce Barth. The week before we played with Peter Bernstein, yeah. playing Mark Copeland the week after. Uh, we have, yeah, it's a great. And then I also do, uh, I've been really getting into playing duets, duos lately. So they have a very nice piano there. So every Saturday for happy hour from 6 to 7.30. It does sound really nice. The piano does piano sound really much, nice. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. Yeah. And smalls and other clubs and small, as well. And, and, and wherever, yeah. Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. If someone wanted to contact you maybe for a lesson or just to um, reach you, how could they uh, reach you? Well, I guess through you or through uh, my email is A-B-K-O-L. Abcole at AOL.com. At AOL yeah. Still on AOL? Still on AOL. <laughs> <laughs> Sticking with it, baby. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and a couple other things I just wanted to say too, and like wrapping up, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, you feel inspired to uh, contact me with questions because I, I just love talking about this stuff. I really do. And, you know, every time I talk about it, I learn more about it, you know, when people ask me questions. And also, I'm thinking that, you know, as I said at the beginning, that this is my take mm -hmm. on what I learned from Joe and it couldn't it can be different from what other people experienced and uh, you know it would be great if this uh, generates some kind of you know talk back about different people's uh, how they manifested it how it evolved yeah. in their playing and their teaching yeah. and or what you know whether something I said is something that they disagree remember completely differently or take issue you know it's all it, it just great it just feels good to me to be able to share this yeah because it's, it's it so, generates so, discussion so, yeah. and it generates discussion and it was so 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 important yeah. to my development as a saxophone player as an improviser as a human you know having yeah. somebody like you know joe being one of a number of you know great teachers that i've been able to work with you know dave liebman Bob Brookmeyer, Larry McKenna, who just passed away, mm -hmm. but you know, great teachers that I've had, I've all learned such great things from them, and all of them have been things that you end up being your own teacher moving forward. You know, right. every everybody that I speak to who studied with Joe has that same experience. That it's right. like ten years later, it's like ah, that's, that's what he was what he talking meant. about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's and it's it's such a great thing, and and, and uh, yeah. Anyway, well, thank you again, Tim. For being thank here. you for doing this yeah. with me. You were fantastic. It was yeah. great. I'm glad I had a chance to. You yeah. know, I'm sure there's so many things I misspoke or forgot about. No, but, no. You know, for another time. Yeah, and if and, if, uh, and just to let everyone know, you can also hear Adam's music on Spotify. I love his CDs, and there's also a lot of like nice videos on YouTube of like him playing with Billy Hart and. You got no Quago yeah, at Gano Bar by yeah, I really did, you yeah. guys play like My Shining Hour. There's like we did play My Shining really like as that. a ballad. Yeah. yeah, it's really beautiful. Yeah. Oh, so nice. thanks again for tuning in and uh, right. please reach out. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks.